I have always wanted to step foot in the Coliseum. It's like the OG Fight Club. Russell Crowe versus Joaquin Phoenix, tens of thousands of people, which is way more than the hockey match I was at last week. Imagine the energy with a sellout crowd. It was the place to be around 1900 years ago, the biggest Roman amphitheater of its time. And maybe I don't have to just imagine it. I could try to go to a packed game in today's world, finding a well-attended sporting event with a sellout crowd in a huge stadium, but I wonder how similar it would actually be. Now, if I want the ambiance of the Coliseum, hockey seems like the obvious choice to me, but it turns out hockey arenas are surprisingly small. Modern estimates have shown that the Coliseum could hold around 50,000 people. So to truly feel the scope of what it was like, I probably have to go to something like a major soccer stadium. And to figure out which one, I'll have to look at some numbers. Basically, I need to take apples and oranges and make them all apples. No offense to oranges. Hi, I'm Sabrina Cruz, longtime suffering Toronto Maple Leafs fan, and this is Study Hall Real World Statistics. Please don't unsubscribe. Casually comparing ancient Roman amphitheaters to modern day soccer stadiums is hard for a lot of reasons. Our global population is larger and our architecture has improved a lot. But that's true for lots of things you might want to compare. To get into a US college, you might take both the ACT, where the maximum score is 36, and the SAT, where the maximum score is 1600. And then you'll want to know which test you performed better on so that you can submit your strongest score. Or maybe you want to compare Alanis Morissette's record sales to those of the Beatles while factoring in how much the music industry and the value of money have changed over time. Standardization helps us shift and scale data values to get them all on a common scale, while making sure that they all still relate to each other in the same way. Like if we start with a data set of six numbers that have a mean of three and a standard deviation of two. We notice that we have points four units below the mean, or at negative one, and points that are two units above the mean, at five. If we want to turn this data set into one we can easily compare to others, we shift all of the points so that the new mean is zero and scale the values so that the standard deviation is one. We do that so that we can preserve those relative differences and don't change the meaning of the data. In the standardized data, you'll see that the points are either two units below the mean at negative two or one unit above the mean at one. Those original distances are cut in half consistently. Now let's apply that intuition to the supreme sanctum of aggression, the hub of gladiatorial energy, the Colosseum. For the sake of basic math, we'll say its capacity was 50,000, which is about 37,794 more than the average amphitheater in my carefully constructed data set of Roman Empire amphitheaters. That's the shifting step, where we make the new mean zero. Then I want to prove that the Colosseum is large in the context of Roman Empire amphitheater capacities. To figure that out, I need to compare it to a typical deviation from the mean, the standard deviation. 37,794 represents 4.13 standard deviations, or a little over four. That is the scaling step so that we have a standard deviation of one. Okay, so the Colosseum is about four standard deviations larger than the average Roman amphitheater. So let's turn to soccer, which apparently everybody loves more than hockey, which is the real fighting sport, because we don't take dives. The largest stadium in our data set seats 114,000 people. That's about 57,871 more than the average soccer stadium in the data set. That stadium is farther from the mean than the Colosseum, but we still need to account for the different scales. 57,871 is 4.05, or a little over four standard deviations in this data set too. Now the soccer stadium capacity is definitely further from the mean in raw numbers. But once we standardize these numbers, we can see that the biggest modern soccer stadium is actually comparable to the Coliseum. They're both the largest of their kind and four standard deviations away from the mean. Standardization is important for comparability, but it has other benefits as well. Like like maybe we want to compare the distributions of our data sets, not just their means and standard deviations. Just looking at histograms of the soccer stadiums and Roman amphitheaters, each on their raw scales, doesn't tell us much because of the vastly different x-axis scales. But if we first standardize the data and then plot those points, everything becomes way easier to see. Like now we see that both data sets have similar size left and right tails, which means their extremes really are relatively similar once we adjust for differences in scale. Determining outliers also depends on the scale of the data, so standardization can help them jump out more easily. Both the Coliseum and the largest soccer stadiums today could be considered
considered outliers, not just because of all of those zeros at the end of their capacity values, but because they are large compared to the rest of their peers in their respective data sets. They're far from the center of the data. Standardization is super useful for other reasons too. It helps ensure that no one data point disproportionately influences the results just because it has larger values than the rest. Like if we wanna figure out how soccer players' ages relate to their salaries, that can be tricky because their ages can range from like 18 to 40 and salaries range from like 50,000 to 20 million once we ditch a few outliers. Those ranges are really different. The change from being 18 to being 19 is way bigger comparatively than the change from making 50 thousand dollars to fifty thousand and one dollars even though both of those are a change of one unit that's going to make it hard to keep track of describing how a change in age is related to a change in salary so to save ourselves a later headache before fitting any models or doing any formal analysis we can standardize the data first that makes it easier to interpret our data quickly and learn whatever it is we're trying to find out. Now, it's all well and good to dive into those standard deviations, but it's important to know how we get there in the first place. Like I said before, standardization lets us turn an apples and oranges situation into an apples and apples situation. That process always follows the same steps, regardless of the data scenario. The nitty gritty of the standardization process starts with a raw score, which refers to the original data value that we are interested in standardizing. Let's call it X. In the Roman amphitheater example, X represented the Colosseum, and its value was 50,000. But remember, that raw score wasn't that useful all on its own. We want to translate it into a z-score, which is the standardized value. Z-scores are what can be easily compared across datasets, and more officially, the z-score is how many standard deviations there are from the mean to the raw score. We want to see how far the raw score is from the mean of our dataset. So to do that, we first subtract the mean from the raw score. Remember that step. In the Roman amphitheater data, the mean capacity was 12,206. Now we're on to the scaling step. We want to take that difference and put it on a standardized scale so that we can easily compare across data sets. So we divide it by the standard deviation. For the Roman amphitheaters, that value is 9,141. Bada bing, bada boom, a z-score. Those 4.13 and 4.05 numbers that we calculated in the beginning were z-scores for the two data points we were comparing. In plain English, that means it would take four standard deviations worth of shifting to get that original Colosseum capacity value to the mean. And remember, part of standardization is setting that mean at zero. So if the z-score is positive, that tells us that the raw score is greater than the mean. And if the z-score is negative, that tells us that the raw score is less than the mean. The Colosseum has a positive z-score, which is a good gut check. We know that it's the largest Roman amphitheater, so its z-score should remind us that its capacity is greater than the average capacity of amphitheaters. And with a z-score of 4.13, we know it's way greater than the mean. Stuff like this is useful in plenty of ways, like when I'm trying to decide what size soccer jersey to buy to wear to a game, and the website says that their sizes run small. What that actually means is that when compared to a bunch of other medium-sized jerseys, the ones made by this company would have negative z-scores. They are smaller than average, so I might want to order a size up. I want to be comfortable yet stylish to fit in with all of the soccer fans. It's also pretty easy to calculate your own z-scores automatically with your favorite spreadsheet software. For our purposes, we're using Google Sheets. You'll first need to calculate the mean and standard deviation of the whole column of data that your raw score is a part of using the appropriate functions. Then choose the raw score you want to standardize, subtract the mean you calculated from it, and divide the difference by the standard deviation you calculated. Make sure to add parentheses as needed so that you get the order of operations you expect. And remember, you need to subtract the mean before you divide by the standard deviation. Now, when values and datasets are standardized into z-scores, their distributions get standardized too. Both the z-scores of Roman amphitheaters and the z-scores of modern soccer stadiums are centered at zero and have a standard deviation of one. A standardized distribution is centered on zero because it represents data as distances from the original mean. Distances can be positive if the data points lie above the mean, negative if the data points lie below below the mean, or zero if the data points are equivalent to the mean. Similarly, a standardized distribution has a standard deviation of one because the distances are scaled by a typical deviation from the mean. This ensures that the standardization process preserves relative distances between each data point and the mean. We don't want to tamper with the patterns in the data. So since we saw a tail in the original data, we see a comparable tail in the standardized data. 
Any distribution of z-scores is a standardized distribution, but there is a special standardized distribution that is especially helpful for statistics. The standard normal distribution is a normal distribution, yes, that normal distribution, with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. It's sometimes called the z distribution. It has all of the properties of a normal distribution, but it's special because it's used as a universal reference for a variety of comparisons and analyses. Understanding the standard normal distribution helps us make better decisions without having to reinvent the wheel every time. Like say I need bigger jean pockets because I have way too many knickknacks and my current pockets are not cutting it. If I can assume that the pocket area approximately follows a normal distribution, I can look for genes that have pocket sizes much greater than the mean. I can also assess how likely it is that I can even find a pair with pockets larger than a particular threshold. Or maybe I want to evaluate claims made by vendors at a hockey stadium who always seem to be underfilling the bags of chips I like to buy. I know that there should be more ketchup chips in there. If they say each bag's weight follows a particular normal distribution, I can see how likely it is that I end up with such a light bag according to their claim. Transforming your normal distribution into a standard normal distribution makes it way easier to work with because you only have to worry about one distribution rather than having to know the particulars of each new normal distribution you come across. It allows you to boil down many different problems into a single solution approach. Really, being able to compare things is critical. It'll help you figure out how big a deal it is to sell out a soccer stadium versus the Coliseum, sure. But it's also great for basic things, like figuring out if a higher paid job in New York really is better than your smaller salary in cheaper Indiana. Knowing stuff like that can give you the information you need to make decisions. And that's the story of how I wound up at a packed soccer game watching a relatively tame match where for some reason there was no blood but lots of dives and a tie? If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full study hall real world statistics course and earning college credit from ASU, check out gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like, comment if you're more of a soccer or a hockey fan, and smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. See you next time.